Great, hey, thanks everyone for joining. We're gonna give everyone a second to get situated before we start. Wonderful, I think we have most people in. We expect some more people to trickle in as we go. But um, thank you so much for joining us today. I realize June is a hectic month and the beginning of summer and vacation. So we really appreciate you making time to join us. We think this will be a really, um, a really productive and uh, helpful conversation. So thrilled you could be here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Meg Becker. I work at the learning agency. And um, one of the work, some of the work that we do is to promote the field of learning engineering. And so we are excited to have monthly AMAs, Ask Me Anything events with leaders in the field who are really pushing this work forward. And so today we have uh, Josh Elder from the Siegel Family Endowment, um, who is here to talk through more about Siegel Family Endowment's theory of change and funding priorities and um, answer all of the questions that you both generated in the, RS in the RSVP form and live today. So before I pass it over to Josh, just covering a couple of ground rules and kind of how this overall um, meeting will flow. So uh, Josh is going to start with a quick presentation to kind of go over some of the endowments um, theory and, and um, priorities just will be a great starting off point and reflects a lot of the questions that you all generated. And then we're gonna hand it over to you all to, for Q&A. So I know a lot of you shared questions already, but just for the purpose of making this more of a conversation, we're gonna be drawing mostly from the questions that we receive within the Zoom chat. So throughout the meeting, feel free to add your questions to the Zoom chat, and then we will call on you to share your questions out loud. Um, if, and for those of you who did not already hear, we're recording this because there's a lot of people who wanted to attend who couldn't make this exact time. So um, please feel free to uh, refer back to this if you have any questions. And um, with that, uh, we will go ahead and get started. So Josh, um, can I thank you again for being here and would love to hand it over to you to get started. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, great to see everyone, old friends, new friends. Uh, really excited to be with you all today for this AMA. Um, also, apologies, uh, been having a few tech issues. So if I freeze uh, for five or 10 seconds, hopefully it should come back to normal. Hopefully I don't freeze in a weird place. But as we've all lived in the Zoom land for two years, we all know that you will end up being frozen with the most awkward face ever. So apologies about that. Uh, but hi everyone, Joshua Elder, Director and Head of Grant Making at Siegel Family Endowment, or you might just hear me refer to it as Siegel. Um, I oversee our grant making here across our three interest areas. Um, quick background for me, and then I'll, I'm going to share my screen and have a few slides for you all, uh, but spent most of my career in education. Um, so started off as a middle school science teacher in traditional public schools, moved into the charter school world uh, with KIPP for a while, still in science and school leadership and then uh, um, ended up moving to South Africa, um, uh, teaching high school chemistry and physics and doing some teacher development work, and then had the opportunity to open up a network of low cost um, private schools, uh, replicating some components of the charter school model, and then came back to the US uh, after quite some time. Uh, and most recently before joining the foundation, I uh, was working at a grantee of Siegel, uh, Computer Science for All, where I was leading strategy around the computer science education movement and thinking about um, how do you create equitable access for computer science um, for students across the US, uh, which is a critical component of our learning uh, interest area and portfolio here at Siegel. And so with that, I will share my screen. And like I said, um, thank you all for uh, a lot of questions that came through in advance. Um, as we built out a few slides, we wanted to keep it brief, but also try to address some of those big questions, but really excited for any and all the questions that you all have um, uh, as we um, engage today. So thank you. So with that, I will share my screen. Here, slide this out the way.
All right, hopefully with that, you all can see my screen. Um, but yeah, so I'll go ahead and jump right in. Um, so about Siegel, who we are, uh, in case you are new to the work that we're doing, I know some of you uh, are some of our current partners, have been previous partners, or just been thought partners and great uh, collaboration friends. But our um, kind of mission at Siegel um, is to understand and shape the impact of technology on society. As you can imagine, when you read that, uh, probably the same reaction that we have all the time is that technology touches everything and has had an impact on society. And so how do you kind of filter that down? And I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that within our three interest areas. But within that mission, uh, aligning it to our vision, um, our vision at Siegel is a world in which all the people have the tools, skills, context necessary to engage meaningfully in a rapidly changing society. And again, we've all seen just how rapid society has changed over the last two and a half years um, uh, with everything that's been happening uh, in the world. Um, how we work um, as a foundation uh, and thinking about the work that we are doing, kind of the key components uh, and pillars of our work that we distilled out here. Uh, one is we really think of ourselves as being super collaborative, right? Like we work closely with our grantees and the partners in the field to develop strategies and solutions that drive progress for our shared goals. We're relationship driven, um, really pride ourselves on having a people first approach to our relationships, grantees, partners, um, and really think about all the different factors and, and the context as we are developing um, our engagement strategies, but really putting people at the center of what we're doing. Um, we try to be risky and experimental. We try to think about our role as a funder in this philanthropic space. How can we have the opportunity to be a bit risky? And sometimes you hear us talk about like how we view philanthropy as society's risk capital, but we're eager to develop new solutions uh, and do work that goes beyond the limits of traditional funder responsibilities. And then the last piece, um, oftentimes as we think about the, the question I get, how do we source our grants? How do we go about our grant making? Really carefully and deliberately, right? Like we don't want or ask that our grantees fit a certain mold. We're not trying to change who they are to fulfill our own objectives. We truly do want to work with the people and organizations um, whose work is forward thinking and kind of true to their core values and align to our values. And so what does that look like in the, the process of grant making? And so this um, image here kind of goes through what the, the grant making process and cycle looks like for us. Um, and so you'll hear me talk a little bit more about kind of our inquiry driven approach and inquiry questions, but our approach to grant making truly is aligned to this inquiry driven approach, thinking about what are the really timely relevant questions that we are thinking about and trying to tackle that are impacting uh, the world in which we, we live in. And so how do we develop these inquiry questions um, that are basically going to help guide how we source and do grant making? And so what are these kind of big questions that we want to address within our three interest areas, which is learning, workforce, and infrastructure? And so once we kind of think about these questions and refine it, and this is both an internal process, an external process, then thinking about how do we perform a landscape analysis? So understanding what's going on in the world. What have we done? Uh, what have organizations been doing to kind of tackle some of these problems and challenges and some of the solutions? What have others in the philanthropic space done? But then thinking about after we have this landscape analysis, okay, what's our role uh, to support this work in the field? Uh, and so being able to support that work is where the grant making actually happens. And then after that, as we go through the relationship and we're supporting the work through the grant, how do we kind of collect and publish the findings that we can share out with our partners, share out with the larger philanthropic space, maybe be a bit catalytic and uh, unlock additional funding for these opportunities, um, but doing this in a way that's very intentional. I think oftentimes a lot of you will probably agree with me as funders, uh, there are a lot of requirements, data collection, reports that have to happen. We try to make sure that we are very intentional about what data do we need, why are we collecting it. And then the biggest piece, what's the so what? What are we going to do about all the data that we've collected and the story and the narrative that we're trying to share to have this impact uh, on society? 
convene stakeholders. Um, we like to have the opportunity to bring uh, organizations together, whether it's the larger funder community or other organizations within this space. And then like the last piece, uh, this inquiry, we have our findings and our learning, how do we apply the knowledge? Um, how do we make sure that we're able to apply what we've been able to learn through our grant making? And then what happens next, right? Like sometimes it might be okay, we're going to go a bit deeper into that question again, test another hypothesis, or maybe our hypothesis was wrong, and we need to go and change that and, and do it again within this kind of inquiry driven approach. But this is kind of just a, a graphic of what that process looks like. It looks nice and neat on this slide. It is not that neat. It is is messy, um, which we love, um, but this truly is guiding uh, the, the inquiry-driven approach and at the heart of what we do. Our interest areas that you uh, will find that we focus on, we say interest areas, but you can think of them as portfolios. Um, interest areas for us are learning, workforce, and infrastructure, and then we do have a fourth one, uh, effective philanthropy. But within our learning, which I'll talk the most about today, um, our learning interest area, we support programs and solutions uh, that are really focused on building lifelong learning opportunities, particularly in computer and data science, and envision an education system that works for everyone by addressing longstanding social and economic inequities. Our learning portfolio originally started with a very strong focus on thinking about computer science, computational thinking. We've recently added data science to that that we've called out. But thinking about these equitable access and opportunities for students to learn these core skills, not that they have to go off and be an engineer or work at a tech company, but understanding the importance uh, and the opportunities that are unlocked when you give these students equitable op um, access and opportunities to learn that. And now really shifting our focus that I'll talk more about learning to thinking about the system of education uh, and the role that it plays and how we can shift from what was designed as a, a very inequitable system to a more equitable system that serves all students. Within our workforce interest area, uh, supporting programs that seek to put equity at the center of our economy via community-driven innovation. Uh, we love the term proximate leaders sustainable solutions to financing skill training programs and expanding and diversifying access to empowering social connections. So again, looking at opportunities, again, to have equity at the forefront of that and how do you support proximate leaders that are able to create solutions to problems within the communities in which they've either lived or that they are dedicated to serving. Innovative financing, we've been looking at thinking about how do you create opportunities for people to upskill, reskill, or have access to education without traditionally having to take out the, the burden of debt. Um, and then the power of social capital and social connections, knowing that it's so important. Uh, and we think about communities and marginalized um, aspects of society oftentimes don't have access to social capital and social connections, the ways in which others do. And so how do you create these networks to be able to allow them to, to have access and opportunities and really be on a upward mobility uh, trajectory and pathway? Infrastructure was our newest portfolio, um, uh, the buzzword uh, of 2020, 2021. But with, for us with infrastructure, we strive to make the infrastructure of today and tomorrow work for all people by supporting initiatives that equitably strengthen all dimensions of infrastructure. And you will hear us talk about from fostering the growth of resilient social networks and communities, strengthening public spaces and buildings, and expanding access to digital life. I'll talk a little more about this multi-dimensional infrastructure. Uh, we had a white paper come out a few years ago and we've now are going to be applying that multi-dimensional lens of physical digital social to what we think um, um, a new kind of approach uh, to education should look like. And then lastly, effective philanthropy, um, supporting the strengthening, support the strengthening of our sector um, by investing in both the philanthropic community and the capacity of nonprofits we serve. So whether it is supporting organizations to think about how do they incorporate feedback, listening to the people that they serve, thinking about how do you close that feedback loop to just being a part of different organizations uh, and collaboratives within philanthropy to increase uh, the, the impact that we can have um, as a sector uh, and the work that we are supporting um, across the world. So 
I'll go into a few more slides here and then excited for some questions. But the, the bulk of the kind of focus for the work that we've been doing recently within our learning portfolio um, uh, and thinking about this multidimensional infrastructure lens. So um, definitely, if you haven't had an opportunity uh, to come across uh, some of our work on infrastructure, really encourage you to, to head to our website, um, head to our insights page, and you'll find both uh, an overview of what we mean by infrastructure uh, and the white paper, and then the actual white paper that we put out around multidimensional infrastructure, building the world that we deserve. But essentially, we had the idea um, of thinking about like, how could we push uh, the notion of redefining what we meant by infrastructure. Um, oftentimes, uh, when we talk about infrastructure, people often think about one of these three components, either physical, social, or digital. Uh, very rarely are we thinking about all three. Uh, and definitely, we were finding a case where people focused on the, the intersection um, or the multidimensional aspects of that. But just in terms of like, orienting us in case this is the first time you're coming across of it. Uh, for us, infrastructure reinforced in today's society is multifaceted and complex. We believe each dimension influences the others. And it's really essential to recognize the interdependence if we're gonna design, fund, and govern infrastructure effectively and efficiently. And again, a lot of this was happening before uh, infrastructure became the hot topic and buzzword and, and kind of debates about what is and isn't uh, infrastructure over this last year. Um, but just to orient you what we think about when we, we think about physical, you can see there, so fixed public assets, roads, bridges, tunnels. Uh, we think about social, government and institution, civil society, and then the like culture and collective knowledge that exists within that. And then I think the one that a lot of people are able to, to really think about uh, and understand is the role of uh, digital. Um, so data, code, algorithms, protocols, uh, and cyber architecture. And so this was originally designed to think about just within our um, infrastructure lens, but we started thinking about if we are looking at a new definition uh, and approach to learning, was there a way for us to then kind of challenge the notion of what um, education and learning should look like. And so what we started doing was thinking about if this was to then layer over what we uh, think about um, education, how could we look at what do we mean by actual physical environments or physical infrastructure of school? And so when we think about physical infrastructure of school, we're talking about the teaching and learning environments that exist both in the in-school space, but then also in the out-of-school space. When you think about a lot of the extracurricular programs, mentorship, after-school hours, things that happen in the community, um, looking at the bridge now between what is the physical with the school building and then what is social, so the role of community, the role of the out of school time. So if you think about the, the intersection there that happens on the, the right side there. And then for digital infrastructure, thinking about how digital infrastructure has been utilized and now more than ever with what we've seen um, uh, during the pandemic, but thinking about uh, digital literacy and rights, thinking about learning management platforms, and then looking at the bridge between digital and social infrastructure thinking about social media, automated decision systems, information integrity, and what could happen there. Um, and then on the left-hand side here, when we think about just pure digital, we're thinking about broadband, and then within school and physical, school computers, devices, internet of all things, uh, but trying to how, think about how can we really push to take this lens of physical, digital, social, and really push for what you're gonna see here as this being our new topic of schools as community infrastructure. And so this has led us to our most recent development uh, and a publication that will be coming out pretty soon um, towards the end of summer, early fall. We've decided to have a conversation uh, and it really is a conversation. This isn't us necessarily thinking this is the right way or right approach, but we're really excited to have dialogue and conversation with people to think about what truly is the role of school. Um, and so you can see here um, at its best, school is a community that exists within physical and digital spaces, but community in which it's situated, 
Um, schools want to realize the vision, face long odds and deep structural impediments, especially in communities that have been traditionally hurt by a narrow vision for school. And then what's the so what by having this kind of multidimensional framing? Um, and, and this is what we believe. And these are like our hypotheses as we think about going back to the tides of the inquiry driven approach. But if we have this multidimensional framing for what school and the schooling environment is, we believe that school, sh it should allow us to elevate the commu school community strengths and resources, expand what schools can do, identify needs that remain unmet, uh, and ensure that they have the resources to do that critical work. And so what does that look like in practice if we think about organizations that are focused on this? And, and I should have made the preface that we're using the term multidimensional infrastructure, we're using physical, digital, and social, but don't get me wrong, like this work has been happening. People might not have called it like multidimensional infrastructure or physical, digital, and social, but this has been going on and organizations probably call it or use their own jargon. And so I do want to acknowledge like this work has been happening. And so for us, we're thinking about like, how do we bring it all together and make a movement around that to support why it needs to have a, a systemic and system-wide impact. But just wanted to highlight a few organizations that we kind of believe um, embody this multidimensional approach and that have been really phenomenal partners and truly mean the, the every sense of the word partner with these organizations uh, that have allowed us to be a part of their learning journey. Um, but Reimagine America Schools was a lot of great work that's happening there with school um, as community uh, education reimagine um, with some of the work that's going on there and thinking about what education should look like and how to make sure it is catered to individual student needs and, and big ideas that are happening there. Transcend, um, uh, which has been really supportive uh, with the work uh, and some of our work there, we're thinking about like innovative school models and how do you connect that to what a community actually needs to be able to contextualize and connect the supply and demand. Uh, and then the, um, Stanford uh, Design School, the K-12 lab there, specifically thinking about the, the kind of, we did an exhibit with them um, at a conference, but the futures approach and thinking about the future of education and being able to design what uh, that should look like. But again, more partners uh, as well within our um, portfolio, but wanted to call out some of these bigger picture organizations that have been really influential in helping us to kind of shape this approach. Um, and then lastly, I think there was a question um, as well that people had asked, and then I'll stop and happy to um, go through questions. But like, what do we look for uh, when we think about uh, what makes a, a great partner or what will make a great uh, opportunity for a grant? And so these were kind of some of the char characteristics that we um, uh, think embody our partners. So they're community driven, um, rely on teachers, staff and local knowledge to build their programs, uh, systems entrepreneurs. So again, thinking about that systems level approach and that systems change, um, field, builder, field builders working in tandem, uh, recognizing long-term change, uh, thinking about how do you do that through the ecosystem of coordinated players rather than just one silver bullet approach. Um, out of the box thinking, uh, like I said earlier, we truly believe that philanthropy is society's risk capital. And so how can we take risk on these big ideas uh, that truly have the power to transform the system um, and not just the system of education and learning, even though that's what I'm mostly talking about, but across the, the board uh, of our other interest areas. Um, and then looking specifically in our learning interest area and the portfolio of our partners, looking for our grant for grantee partners that truly take into account all three dimensions um, of infrastructure. So looking at the physical, the digital and social and how that can be combined uh, to have that larger systemic uh, impact on making a more uh, equitable system of education that truly is at the center of community and truly is designed to really serve uh, all 
all students, families, and communities. And so with that, I apologize. I know that was a lot of information. A lot of this can be found uh, on our website. Uh, we are actively in the process uh, of updating um, our information there as we've been making some shifts uh, with our kind of focus areas and strategy uh, and have an insight page there that I encourage you to check out as we're trying to be a little more transparent about what we're doing, what we're thinking, what we're seeing. Um, but yeah, with that, I will stop sharing my screen so I can see you all. Um, and yeah, excited to talk about some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, so we have a lot of great questions coming in. And just for those of you who joined late, even if you submitted a question in the RSVP form, please also put it in the chat because we're going to mostly be going off of the questions that come in the Zoom chat. So we'll start off with a question from Matt Miller. Matt, do you want to share your question um, out loud? I had two questions in there, but I'll start with the, the one I uh, inserted earlier. Thanks so much, Josh. Uh, really great to, to learn more. Uh, how do you think about the time horizon for impact and the, the loop that you shared uh, You know, for those inquiry cycles? What does that I mean, that's presumably not a not a tight cadence, but how do you how do you think about the time for impact and the time for running that loop? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Great question. And one of the things that we oftentimes are thinking about, one thing I will mention uh, in terms of how we operate at Siegel, and I spoke mostly from the grant making side. And so we do have a research side as well. So John Irons uh, is our senior VP of research and leads the research team where we collaboratively are working closely together, especially on thinking about the impact, uh, the monitoring, evaluation and assessment. And so primarily when we are looking at what are we trying to learn, that question is, is this something that we are able to actually collect data and be able to have some learnings within a year? Most of our grants fall within a one-year cycle. We do have multi-year grants on a three-year cycle, but we have to be very careful because even within a three-year grant, we know some of this work, some of the things that we are super interested and passionate about are going to take years. And so for us, it is acknowledging that and right-sizing like what we specifically want to focus on within the year or three years, or maybe after three years, we make a decision that we want to then either uh, pursue the, a similar question with that organization, renew the current work or look for other opportunities. But that is something that has been tricky that we wanna be cognizant that a year is very short. And so if it is a year opportunity, what are we looking for uh, to make sure we don't set ourselves up for failure, but we also don't wanna force the organization to be fast tracking something that if we're talking systems levels change, it's gonna take a large amount of time. Um, and, and that's why we are very like transparent when we work with our partners. Um, our grant writing process uh, is completely open and transparent. We actually take on the bulk of that work, um, but we do ask for the grantees to be really influential as we write what are the kind of outcomes and data that we want to collect to make sure that it is possible. And we might find six months into the grant, we need to change that because you know what, like it's just not going to happen or there is a change of priorities from the organization. So flexibility um, is truly key within that. Great. Um, so we have um, a couple of questions that have asked for clarification on some of the um, priority areas. So I think Charles uh, Fidel, I think it is, if you wanna start off with your question. Oh, certainly. Uh, thank you, Josh, for the, the presentation, and thank you, Meg, for hosting it. I'm just wondering what are the relative priorities between well, your priority areas, given that uh, you started with computer science, added data science, but seem to be very interested in uh, this multidimensional infrastructure. So how, how, what's, if there was a percentage allocated to each one, what would, you, what would that be? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And I think for us, this is something that we are actively looking at, where right now, I think we're trying to figure out like, what is their balance? I mean, we prioritize everything within the three interest areas. So like, there's not one that's more important, even though we had a strong focus in the beginnings were around the computer science. I think what 
happens is that the portfolio, the interest area portfolio starts to become broader, but in terms of workforce, uh, infrastructure and learning, they all take a kind of equal um, playing field uh, and focus of the work that we do. You will see things shift around. Like this year has been a big year for us on workforce, uh, just because we were revising our workforce strategy and we just put out a series of posts on our insights page on the website and have been doing some active grant making towards that. You'll probably see that shift as we have uh, uh, the new white paper with this imagining schools as community infrastructure come out. So within each year, you will see things move around, but we do have a, we try to keep an equal focus on the three. And then that effective philanthropy is something that we're doing across the board um, as well there. Thank you. If I, since I have the mic, can I ask also what a question that's valid for everyone? which is how does one apply for a grant? So I, I missed the, the end piece there. Oh yes, how would one go and apply for a grant? Yeah, a great question. Um, so we don't uh, do RFPs or solicit proposals. Uh, relationships are super like important for us. Having opportunity to be in front of people uh, to look at the work. I know there's gonna be a form uh, that's gonna be put in the chat as well for people to, to be connected, but we truly do uh, uh, make sure that we are proactively sourcing and having conversations. So even though we don't do RFPs, we are trying to, to meet as many people as possible, look at things that do come inbound our way and make those decisions. So definitely uh, welcome the opportunity for you to put information uh, into the forum there. And then our teams are, are always looking uh, to have conversations. Like I said, the relationship is at the forefront which oftentimes means quite a few conversations uh, to make decisions about areas of alignment or making decisions maybe this isn't aligned for right now with our strategy, but it will be in the future. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of this isn't necessarily submit a form, do our RFP, but it's us getting to know you and making some decisions uh, about where there could be potential there or where we think it might not be for us, but there's others in our space that we know it might be more aligned to. Great. And just as Josh mentioned, um, we put in a form in the chat a couple of times and we'll do it. We'll, we'll also share it in the follow up email. So if you have ideas to share or documents to share with Josh, we're going to be collecting all those and sending them to um, to him after the call. So, um, you know, given that you said the workforce has been a big priority for you this year, I want to hand the mic over to uh, Faith uh, McBree, I think it is, um, to share her question about the workforce portion. Hey, Josh, thanks so much for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, I'm with Transfer VR. We do workforce uh, and career exploration training through VR. And I wanted to know, are you guys focused primarily on upskilling existing workers in the skilled trades and getting them into those, you know, entry level jobs that pay sustainable wages, but, you know, have the opportunity for upper career mobility? Are you focused more on adults or are you guys also focused on building that pipeline at a younger age too? Yeah, great question. Uh, and I know I didn't talk too much about workforce, uh, but like I said, uh, has been a big focus uh, for us. I mean, one thing that I will say that answers part of your question, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, some shifts in the strategy. Before we kind of approach um, learning, thinking about kind of what happened in K-12, and then within workforce, it was very focused on kind of the upskill and reskill of adults. We have shifted and now take this kind of lifelong learning approach and so there is this intersection now that exists between our learning portfolio or interest area and the workforce side uh, of what lifelong learning looks like. So primarily that has been focused on adults within the upskill and reskill space. Uh, but now we are starting to think about what does the larger kind of system of that look like. So some of our programs uh, and partners within the, the workforce space are focused on upskilling and reskilling a variety of segments of the adult population. Uh, there are organizations that are focused on uh, people without a degree, um, so no two-year or four-year degree. There are those that are focused on, they have a four-year degree, um, but they're either unemployed or underemployed. And then we've recently kind of 
even went into the, the higher ed space and supporting organizations that are specifically serving um, uh, students in their junior year and making sure that when they are in that senior year and thinking about what uh, job they're looking for, it is putting them onto the right pathway for upward mobility. Um, one other shift within that with the workforce has been thinking about a lot of the work on the upskill and reskill side uh, previously was focused on getting that good job and really thinking about what's the definition of a good job. So are we focus on like living wage, sustainable wage. Are we using like MIT's definition or others that have their definition of what a good job or quality job looks like? And now saying, yes, that's important. And that's step one. But now trying to put some of our focus on making sure how do you support that pathway to upward mobility? How do you make sure they don't, especially if they're going through upskill and reskill, how do you make sure it isn't in two or three years, they're right back in that cycle? And because they upskilled or reskilled into a certain job that may or may not have a pathway to upper mobility or maybe doesn't even exist anymore and have to upskill and reskill again, we have a much more of a critical lens on understanding what is step one of the eventual pathway for sustainability uh, and upward mobility within that, within the, the adult population there. Awesome, thank you very much. Great, so we may come back to workforce in a minute, but just to be uh, provide some flexibility and um, time across all the portfolios, wanna move to the infrastructure piece. There's been a lot of questions on better understanding what you mean and how partnerships work. So uh, I'll hand it over to first Meg, Megan McDonald. Do you wanna share your, your question? Sure, um, thank you. This has been like tr truly informative. And um, also it's always, um, inspiring to hear when people are aligned with exactly what you're hoping is progressing in the educational space. And so thank you for that. Um, my question leans into the definition of physical. Um, what I kind of implied is that our cohorts are global because we do truly believe in proximate leadership. Um, you know, keep going, meeting people where they are. Um, most of our, uh, we are a, um, basically a talent incubator and a research lab for uh, people to gain, you know, training in AI and data science, and then utilize it within their community to do a, build a portfolio and social impact. Um, and so we do, our, most of our scholars are in Africa and Southeast Asia. And so, you know, we do do physical kind of reunion events because we really do believe in lifelong learning, keeping the community going, having, you know, graduated scholars impress upon, you know, the network and mentorship opportunities, but we really don't have any physical structure to our plan. And so, yeah, I'd just like to dive, dive into that a little bit more. Yeah, and, and, and this is a question about more so, uh, because also I know there was a question about like, I know we had mentioned we look for people that have all three. And so like, what does that mean if you don't have, all three or is there specifically within that physical infrastructure something I can help clarify? Well, I feel, I feel like, um, you know, uh, all of the, um, all of the sensory mechanisms is necessary to really impress relationship building. And so I just want to make sure that it's not like, oh, you know, we actually have a mission to like bring people together physically. And if that's not in within the scope of your trajectory, then, you know, it's more about that won't be part of what we do, you, you know, on a, in a sense of if that's part of the pedagogy um, mm -hmm. that, you know, the founders have a mission on, that's all. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, thank you for, for clarifying that. No, I mean, I think we, I mean, to that component, to the component about we look for people that have all three, I think the caveat there, all three, where it makes sense, right? Like, if you were to look at some of our grantees and partners, they're going to be much stronger, maybe on one or two, um, or some of them will have kind of equal footing on all three. But I think that what you will also see in your here, um, our executive director and president, Katie Knight, oftentimes talks about for us that context is key um, and that we truly believe like there isn't this kind of cookie cutter approach. So as I am highlighting kind of all three components here, that's why the relationship and understanding what's going on. So like we were having a conversation and understanding like the importance of bringing people together and whether that's physical or virtual or what does that mean? Like that's why we really value the conversations and the deep learning that happens before we think about kind of what a grant will look like. Um, but again, if you were to look at all of the organizations, 
they don't fall nice and neatly kind of on the spectrum. Uh, and so that's why even our definition of physical infrastructure, let's take that for instance, might look very different depending on the context in which the organization is, is working in. And so the physical infrastructure might look completely different in, in a learning grantee portfolio versus what it looks like in our kind of pure infrastructure interest area as well. So constantly that as much as I've set out this framework and kind of showed you some of the lenses in which we look through and operate in, the context is so important uh, when it comes to what partnership, what questions we're asking, uh, and what work we're supporting there, which is why we really do like spending the opportunity to understand before we make decisions. Great. Um, and we have another question, kind of better understanding this physical space. So Mary, Mary Jo uh, Dry, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly. Do you want to chime in with your question? Oh, we may have lost her. Uh, let's go to John Walter, and Mary can come back if she if she. I'm, I'm here, Mary. Oh. Good. Yeah, sorry. Okay, great. No worries. Uh, yes, just curious as to as to what you mean more specifically with that sort of uh, help, you know, that assistance with facility and building and things of that nature. Yeah, so great question. Uh, and I'm going to put in the uh, chat here as well for people. Uh, if you haven't went to uh, the website on especially the, the infrastructure page there. Um, but when we think about the physical infrastructure and some of the work that's been happening and understanding like the importance of the role that physical infrastructure plays. And so whether that is, so as you heard me talk about design, govern, fund, are there opportunities in which we can kind of challenge some of the notions of what designing for physical infrastructure looks like? So some of the work that we're doing specifically within the learning uh, interest area is uh, some of our partners are working with school districts and thinking about uh, and so much research has been done um, when you look at physical infrastructure and you look at the what has and hasn't worked in terms of challenging the notion of what's a classroom, what's not a classroom, how do you break down the walls, how do you create transparency, how do you create like movable components within that, but looking at how the physical space ultimately plays a role in impacting the, the kind of outcomes that you are focused on. And so within learning, that's really the physical space, both within in school, but also out of school. So the, the bridge to community and social there. If you look at what that means in our infrastructure area, the kind of bridge between physical and social, we'll look at some of the community-based assets. So the role of libraries, the role of museums um, that serve as an asset to the community, but also are a physical component of infrastructure. Um, some of our work as well for physical infrastructure has been thinking about um, with work that we've been doing specifically focused on rural America, um, looking at just access. And so thinking about transportation, uh, thinking about the um, some of the quality um, of water and things like that. So a wide swath of things, um, again, being very like, uh, I think for us being very cognizant of the fact that there's so many other policies, mechanisms, and, and, and levers of influence that happen when we talk about how money is being allocated for certain components of infrastructure. For us, it's just having that conversation, helping organizations thinking about that. And especially now more than ever with the influx of infrastructure dollars flowing, what does that mean if you are focused on physical infrastructure and improvements of a physical school space and not so much on the, the, the digital and social, if you wanna focus at the area of intersection, what does that mean? Um, and so if you uh, go to the website and within the white paper, we try to have uh, examples and case studies within each of the three, um, but you'll see it's a pretty strong focus on, on organizations or things that were at the intersection. Um, but happy to provide more examples of, of what that looks like in organizations uh, that are either focused on one out of the three or all three within infrastructure, both on learning and in the infrastructure interest area there. Great, thanks so much. John, um, do you wanna, John Walter, do you wanna share your question as well? 
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Joshua, for taking the time to share with us all today. Um, I'm John Walter with Lean Lab Education, a nonprofit um, educational technology research and development innovation lab. Um, and I'm curious with your uh, organization's focus on infrastructure, how important are partnerships within the larger context of an ecosystem? Uh, how important is that for your grantees and maybe some examples of uh, partnerships that your current grantees have? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the partnership uh, is extremely important, right? Um, uh, to think about that we, as much as we don't want to work in silos, uh, also want to make sure as much as it makes sense that our partners are not working um, in silos. And so I think a great example of where that I can highlight this specifically within the learning work. And we actually just had a webinar recently. Um, some of the work that we've been doing with Reimagine America Schools. Um, and so the, the work uh, that they have been doing had been specifically around the physical infrastructure side of thinking about the role of school. Uh, Ron Bogle, who leads that work through the National Design Alliance, um, uh, and then specifically the Reimagine America Schools piece, has been thinking about how do you put schools at the center of community. And so one of the things that we realized with the work that he was doing and our focus was that oftentimes you take school, for instance, the work that's happening there and the conversations and decisions are usually just school-based. So you have your school decision makers feeding up to your superintendent. Oftentimes there's a disconnect to what's going on at the city level. Uh, what are the conversations that are happening in terms of the community in which the city is focused on that the school is a part of? So some of the work that we are currently doing with them um, out in Georgia, just outside of Atlanta uh, in Clayton County, and specifically within Forest Park, um, a city within Clayton County, is bringing together uh, the, the city and the school district to really focus on if they have this idea that they want the school to be at the center of community. They have a community Forest Park that they are currently undergoing revitalization, they're building a new school. And so we've been brought in to really partner with them to think about what partnerships do they have? What partnerships do they need? And, and what's the brokering that needs to happen to bring these people together? How can we, as the funders of the Reimagine America Schools work, be able to convene people to have these conversations and kind of help make the connections and conversations that will then formalize into the partnerships to make this actually happen. And then most importantly, make it sustainable. Um, and so I think that was a great example that we spent a lot of time just going down there and meeting with people, understanding what was needed and understanding partnerships, both local and national that would be needed to make this work. Um, and so just recently, just recently have started moving that work forward. And so we'll probably have more to share about what partnership formation uh, looks like both on the front end and then the role of partnerships to make this work sustainable uh, at the end. Great, thank you so much. Great, so I think, um, you know, we're getting close to time. So I wanna transition a little bit more to the learning piece. And there's a couple of questions that we have that really cross cut both the infrastructure and the learning piece. So um, I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Brandon Pitzer, I think it is, um, to share his question. All right. Brandon, if you oh, sorry are about that. Oh, okay, sorry, I was great. <laughs> software. <meeting. laughs> no worries. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my question was uh, just briefly about um, we're, we're a, a developer of um, uh, learning interactives and stuff and, and tools and that kind of thing. So I was wondering if digital interactives, learning content, um, that kind of resources, uh, particularly when you envision it for a K-12 environment um, and with the intent to foster uh, workforce talent uh, pipeline, um, does that qualify? Does that, you know, kind of where does that fall into the, um, the overall structure that you're talking about? Yeah, great question. Um, and definitely falls into a few different buckets of our work. So kind of the ed tech space um, and learning, uh, the digital infrastructure. I mean, we've been longtime supporters 
um, uh, in that ed tech space. Um, uh, David Siegel, who is the, the chairman of Siegel Family Endowment, has been uh, very much focused on uh, thinking about democratizing um, kind of education through the ed tech space. So with his involvement uh, with Scratch and the Scratch Foundation, we're longtime supporters of Khan Academy um, and then others in that, in that world. So definitely we've been looking at ed tech tools uh, that are uh, reinforcing um, or improving kind of the, the education system or components within that or specific areas of curriculum. Uh, but definitely it's something that we uh, have supported and will continue to support and look for innovative opportunities uh, as well for that. Very encouraging answer. Thank you very much. Great. And um... One more piece on kind of the, the computer science component, component. Sandro, do you wanna share your question? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, I run a nonprofit called uh, Project Found Ed and um, we are a community of um, founders of ed tech companies dedicated to promoting equitable outcomes as the goal of our industry. We're uh, just crossed over a thousand members now. Super excited about that. Um, one of the things we've been thinking about a lot is, you know, we've got this community of ed tech founders and that's great, but it, it really doesn't do anything for learning outcomes until we figure out how to connect it to what educators are doing in the classroom. And one of the primary blockers we've identified is that schools still don't have a good or standardized process to discover, evaluate, and ultimately adopt technology within the classroom. For us, that feels like that kind of capacity building feels like a, a necessary component of infrastructure that needs to happen. And I'm just wondering on your thoughts. Yeah, no, I could not I agree with you more. I mean, I think this was highlighted for us. Uh, I won't say what and where, but um, a large gathering, an event uh, that is focused on the, the ed tech space. Uh, and I think you just saw the, the deals that were being made and the amount of money that is flowing into the ed tech space and how uh, school decision makers, particularly superintendents, uh, are being sold on what uh, th what they think will be what's needed for for their students, but yet there isn't necessarily this framework or uh, an equitable way to help them understand what's needed. I think for us, we are super interested in that, especially after realizing uh, the interest in ed tech is just increasing, and a lot of money uh, is being wasted, and students are being impacted in negative ways uh, because of either decisions are being made on what false promises they're being sold, a flashy presentation or a pitch or competition. And so how do you make sure you're helping people make decisions on what impact is needed? I think a great example for that for us has been our partnership with Computer Science for All uh, and uh, within the work that they've been doing uh, with their script framework, which is a strategic framework to help schools think about what equitable computer science education looks like for all. agnostic, um, hardware agnostic, but it helps them think about what are the decisions that they need to make? What are the questions that they need to be asking? Um, and so for us, I, I think that's something that we want to explore. And I think you're right to say that that is a, a play on infrastructure. Um, and so excited to, to look at that further or see what people are doing out there because it, it's, it's needed. Uh, and it's just unfortunate how much money is being wasted and again the negative impact that that is having on our students and families across the, the U.S. Great yeah I'll submit through the form thanks. Great um, well I want to be respectful of everyone's time and I realized that we did not get to all of the questions but we tried to hit all the topic areas and um, Josh I think there was just uh, too much interest so that's a good problem to have. Um, so, you know, before we wrap up, I just wanted to thank all of you for being here. I know um, uh, it's hard to make this time and I really appreciate all these great questions and the engagement. Uh, I just wanted to make a plug if you're interested to connect more with some of these people on the call and in the community, we host a uh, a monthly uh, informal networking event. So we'll put the RSVP in the chat and feel free to join us. Uh, it's the first Wednesday of every month. Um, and uh, we'll also have following AMAs and we'll follow up with you about 
But, um, you know, just wanted to mostly thank Josh for being here. Uh, you know, obviously you put a lot of work into the presentation and you were very thoughtful in all of the responses to the questions. So we're just incredibly grateful for not only your work in this space, but um, taking the time to talk with us today. And before we close out, just wanted to hand it over to you, Josh, if you have any final reflections or um, final uh, words of wisdom for the group before we sign off. Yeah, no, I definitely echo uh, the things. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks to my colleague, Laura, who I think you all have seen in the chat that was dropping resources as well. And I think most importantly, just thank you all for the work that you're doing uh, because that's what's needed. I encourage you to, to fill out the form that's in the chat with information, links, um, or ideas and questions. Uh, again, our, my team uh, will be excited to look at all of that, but just really appreciative for you all taking the time uh, and look forward to potentially connecting or learning more from you all in the future. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Josh. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.